So last week we didn't make it super far. We talked, we finished up immigration, which we'd spent several weeks on, and we started a new topic. Do you remember what it was? Marriage. marriage. You know, how should we approach marriage? Uh, and so, again, this is kind of one that's really easy, I feel like, to go through from a biblical angle. And so it's it makes it easier for us to kind of determine how to vote and how does it impact us. But I, I want to remind you of the questions that I threw out there that we kind of had some, some interesting response to when we were going through these, if you remember. And so what is the biblical view of marriage and the family? We're going to do that one. But this is the one that kind of got the oohs and the ahs. Should the government set the definition of marriage or stay out of it completely? And if people say, stay out of it, you know. And we're going to talk about this one because it's, it's kind of a fine line. Um, should this be an issue that we even consider at all when we're deciding who to vote for? Um, important questions. So this is just a quick reminder, refresher from last week. Should Christians stop imposing their beliefs on everyone? That's usually what you hear in society. You know, leave me alone. So just a few questions to remind us kind of where we were going and, and as we jump into these things a little bit. And so we talked a little bit about marriage. We talked about Genesis 1, God created, you know, man. There was no suitable helper amongst anything he created. He needed someone that was like him but different from him to be able to accomplish the things that God wanted him to accomplish. So he made woman, and he didn't make another man, if you remember. That was one of the things we talked about. It wasn't going to work to just have two guys. As weird as that might be to think, well, you know, why don't you just, you have a really good design with this one. Just make another one of those. And they two can work together and take dominion over the earth and do everything. But that's, it wouldn't have worked. It didn't work. Two men, it doesn't work. And so the, the question is, who's the, whose plan is it? The guy who, you know, the one who started this, God, when he decided, how do I want this to go? What's the ultimate idea here? Like, what's the plan for the creation of man? And why did God say, well, after he created man, it's not good. Is this the only time he says this during the creation process? It's not good for man to be alone. Can't fulfill the plan. It doesn't mean that man's not good as created. It means that the plan can't be completed as it currently sits. And so I need to do something to, to make it possible. And so then he creates woman. And so this is part of the plan. And if, if you're not in line with the designer's plan, it's not going to make a lot of sense of why it is the way it is. I mean, if God's the one who sets the rules, he creates the, the world, he creates the thing. It's his game. If you don't understand his mindset on this, it kind of becomes this free-for-all weird thing, which is kind of where we are somewhat today. And so what's the designer's plan? Well, obviously I had clear plans in his mind for the man. I didn't just make him for no purpose. I have a purpose for him. And it was to fill the earth, subdue the earth, right? Spread the glory of God, essentially, throughout the entire earth. And man would not be able to achieve success in God's plan by being alone and it wasn't just alone meaning i need some like a companion a friend he needed someone that would complement him a perfect counterpart that would allow him to do the first part which is the plan what's the plan and so needs the counterpart like him so god's creative process did not involve making another man like adam to assist him we talked about that god needed someone not like adam to assist him properly it's kind of interesting to think when when god created adam he created him perfect right perfect man but he's not god and he's still a unique design and that means that his his design doesn't include every other possible design out there because god comes in and says i'm going to make a woman and she's like him but yet she's nothing like him at the same time right but the two together do exactly what needs to be done they complement each other perfectly and god knew what he was doing with that Man and woman were defined by God in the beginning. You know, Genesis 1, Genesis 4, right here in the very beginning, this all takes place. Man and woman were designed biologically and psychologically different from one another for the plan of God. Would you agree with that? Yes. Yeah. I know they don't maybe teach that in school, but that's just the facts. They're different in these ways for purpose because of design. Specifically, Man and woman were designed to create more humans. Would you agree with that? Yes. 
Okay, be fruitful and multiply was a process God wanted carried out. And it didn't work with man by himself. He could have designed something where man could have just by himself produced, I guess, children. But that's not reflective of the character of God. That's not reflective of his design. So we're not doing it that way. We're doing it differently. And so he creates man and he creates woman. And that's what their goal is. Adam and Eve, you have a job to do. Create more people. So I, I say that because it sounds so simple, but that is the fundamental mandate, piece of the mandate, is be fruitful and multiply. God tells it to Adam and Eve. After the flood, what does he tell Noah? Same thing. Same thing. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. That is your objective, is to fill the earth. So anytime you hear like Edenic mandate, you know, the term the Edenic mandate, what's the mandate that was in Eden? It was be fruitful and multiply, subdue the earth, fill the earth. And so that's what their job is. You know, when they had the instructions, that was it. You know, it wasn't build towers. It was go and do these things. They were also designed for the raising of those infant humans into adults. Would you agree? I know these sound like fundamental things that you learn when you're a child, but they were designed specifically. Man had a role in that process. Woman had a role in that process, and they were different. Would you agree? Yeah. The mom does things differently than the dad does, but they're both critical to the proper development of this infant, this child. Now, I, I don't know how to describe this, so this is my best guess is how to separate these two. But I figure, like, when you think of a, the, the woman and the mother, the nurturing, the feeling, and I'm just looking, thinking about this from my own kids. You know, what is it their mom gives them that I don't? You know, why, we're very different, even though we're united and together. But anytime there's hurt or there's something like that, it seems like my wife's the one who runs in and scoops up and sympathizes with their feelings. And I'm just like, suck it up, buddy. You know, <laughs> you know your, your arm's not missing, you know. And, and so that's why I put, without feeling, <laughs> men are more res end result minded. What's the bottom line? How do we fix the problem? How do we get there? Is that a fair assessment of how these yeah. things work? My wife is more going to be, how do we feel while we get to that point? <laughs> My point is, how do we just get to this point? You know, let's just fix these things. And, and yet you need both. You, you know, kids need to know that, yeah, we've got to get to where we're supposed to be. But at the same time, how does it impact the person? How do we care about each other? How do we treat each other? How do things go along the way? Sympathy, compassion. And so you think about God up there saying, how do we design this process? How do we do this? And he's like, well, all I, have, I have my character, and I have this goal in mind that we need to stay focused on getting the plan accomplished and doing these things. But I also care about compassion and mercy and love and the nurturing piece. And not to say guys can't be, but... Just the just the way that these two dynamics would work would bring about this proper reflection of the character of the one true God. Like it's two things that get to, to show him to the children. So if you eliminate one of these, what happens? You know, what happens to, to the... You, you're not seeing something that necessarily... Now, I think that God brings in people to fill those voids. I mean, there's people that lose their lose a parent... <laughs> And, you know, the, the other parent has to kind of try to fill in some of that spot or might have a grandparent that comes in or a friend or some a mentor or something that kind of takes these positions. But as it was designed, this is what God wanted for these purposes. They were, they were planned for these purposes. Any variation to this design would lead to problems and conflict. And that's, uh, you know, the problem is if, you, if God d had all the things he could create and he had a million uh, opportunities and options, you know, we forget that God knows all options real and possible, the ones that are actually going to happen and the things that could possibly happen. And when he's designing and says, this is how I'm doing it, he's considered every other possible thing already. Do you realize that? And this was the best one. So why is, it, is this the best one of all the others? that he clearly in his all-knowingness would have been able to process. This is the one that's going to work. All the others are going to have problems. They're not going to work properly for this plan, for this objective. And so when, we, when I say any variation to this design would lead to problems and conflict, it's exactly right because God would have done it differently if it could have worked better some other way. 
and it doesn't. It doesn't work better any other way. So here's some, just some things to think about. The design of marriage came before Jewish law. Now, why am I saying that? Because a lot of people will say this whole idea of man, woman, union coming together was part of a tradition from some ancient culture that's trickled down into our society. But there weren't any Jews at that point. No, there, were, there wasn't. We didn't really have any nations at this point. You just have Adam and Eve in a garden somewhere, right? And God says, here's how we're doing it, man, woman. And he even says, man will leave his father and mother, cling to his wife. The two will become one flesh. That's, that's said before there's any nations, before they've even gotten kicked out of Eden. That's right. And so when someone says, no, this is just a Jewish tradition, or it's a tradition for this group, it existed before that. This is just fundamental to humanity. It has nothing to do with a border around this country or this culture. It has to do with being a human being. Right, And so I say that to say that you know, Jewish law, as much as it's important, we can't say, well, it only showed up in the nation of Israel. Because some people will throw it and say, you know, the stuff that applies to Israel doesn't apply to everybody else. That was God's nation. They did it a certain way. It doesn't apply to the nations outside like it did to them. Some of their dietary rules, and you think about some of that. This is one of the things that came before that. So it does apply to everybody. Every human being is subject to this, to God's design for marriage. The definition of marriage is not restricted to only the nation of Israel. That's important to keep in mind. Marriage was included in the Ten Commandments due to its importance. What's the, what's the command about marriage? There is no, like, you shall get married. What is it that's talking about marriage? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Yeah. So what's God saying by making a command like, don't commit adultery? Does it have to do with marriage? It does. Of course it does. It has to do with faithful marriage, marriage between a man and a woman, and it being a sacred union that is not to be infringed upon or violated. Right? Super important. So of all the commandments you could throw out there, don't kill, don't steal, don't lie, you know, don't you know, have false witness. God says, oh, by the way, let's, let's make sure we understand marriage is so important, I'm going to make a command that deals directly with it. Don't commit adultery. There it is, Exodus 20, 14, you shall not commit adultery. Now, the definition of marriage has not changed in the scripture. When I say that front to back, cover to cover, has the definition changed? No. Old Testament, New Testament? No. Hasn't changed. So, and Jesus actually takes the position, he even quotes Genesis, man shall leave his father and mother, you know, when they're asking him about divorce and those types of things, he's talking about not separating, you know, uh, the, the union. So the definition biblically has not changed. God didn't all of a sudden kind of become a progressive and say, you know, we, we could probably ease up on the, the definition. I, Old Testament, that's kind of old fashioned. Maybe in the New Testament we can do it differently. Doesn't do that. Con continues to hold to the same view. Historically, Every nation or society has held some type of union between man and woman, or what we would call marriage. You can go to any civilization, even if they were pagans. They had a union between a man and a woman. And it was, on, it was to be honored. I mean, you did, I'm going to talk about a couple variations to that in a minute. But you really can't find a civilization where this didn't to some degree exist in different forms. But it was this man, he takes a wife, and then they come together. They produce children in about every civilization that's ever existed. So you can see where the universal mandate all the way back to Eden has really been in every culture, in every nation across the planet. And it's been traditionally looked at in history as a union between who? One man and one woman. Or sometimes they change the number, but it's always man, woman, right? <laughs> We're going to talk about that in a minute. Now, polygamy and those types of things, we'll talk about that. It's been promoted in every society since the beginning of civilization. What's the, the glory that people want to achieve in the civilization? Yeah, you, you have children. That's a big one. You, know, you produce offspring, and then they carry on your legacy. and you, know, you keep these things going. And that's how society continues, right? It just grows and it continues. So why has it been promoted? I know it sounds kind of like a weird question, but why the promotion of that, even in non-Christian nations, why the promotion of, of marriage as traditionally? Because 
help. Because God said. Because God said, and even if they didn't understand God, what did they understand fundamentally about the just the mechanics? We have kids. You have you you, you get married. You produce offspring. What happens to the country? It grows. it grows. I mean, it sounds really simple, but we want the nation to grow and to flourish. And so, as these people are getting older. We need people, another generation, to come in and keep this country growing. And so what happens if they say we're not going to promote marriage and the Edenic mandate? No more be fruitful and multiply. We're going to take that off the table. We don't want you to do that. What happens just in a common sense looking at it, limit the, you know, wipe out the spiritual aspect of it. What happens to the nation if you promote that? It ceases to exist, doesn't it? So if you're, if you're a survival of the fittest person, you know, if you're an evolutionist and you just say, hey, it's all about just survival, you should be 100% pro-marriage, pro-family, pro-Edenic mandate, have kids. Because the nation that has more kids spreads out, grows, and even if you look at it just from that angle, it's being fruitful. It's, it's multiplying, right? Which is what God wanted in the beginning. Be fruitful and multiply. So it's, it's fundamental to the flourishing of a, of a nation to continue to have children, right? If you stop having kids in the country, eventually you're going to just, time is going to tick away and your country is going to have no one in it, <laughs> right? If you don't promote that, if it doesn't become the thing of, you know, that, that everybody's doing. And, and I put here the God-given definition of marriage is fundamental to a thriving, got to have more people coming to replace people who are passing away. Healthy, we'll talk about that in a second. Happy, there's clearly psychological things that come from marriage and from having children. And when it comes to f the fulfillment of that, uh, growing is kind of in that as well as the thriving. Got to continue to grow as a people, grow as a nation, grow as a society. There are some biblical <coughs> marriage rules. Now, these I'm taking right out of Old Testament stuff. Okay, so I'm going right back in Leviticus. And just a few things that are mentioned. Uh, don't do what the surrounding nations do with it. That's in Leviticus 18. In fact, God says, listen, I know it's been distorted, but you, Israel, your job is to preserve it as it was originally intended. So don't do what they're doing. Okay, Number one when it comes to marriage, don't do what they're doing. Intimacy, marriage, relationships have rules, and God knew about these, so he gave a lot of instructions on them. How about no relatives? Don't marry your family members. Okay? Now, there became a time... When that became a rule, but it wasn't always a rule. Why? At one point, the mandate was to carry it out. You would have to marry someone that was a relative. You know, think of Adam and Eve. You got you know, 500 kids, we'll say. You're probably going to marry a sister or a brother. That's just the way it is. And so at some point in the process, God said, this is not necessary anymore. We've gotten so far away as the spider web went out you don't have to marry your direct relative anymore. And it was for reason, probably for some of that as well, with some of this design piece. Uh, no one else's spouse. Well, that's not my sister or my brother, So, but why is God restricting that one? Because of the exclusivity and the importance of one man, one woman, God's brought them together, they're committed to each other, they are in a sacred union, just the two of them, and you're not to break that. You're not to insert yourself into that union, and they're supposed to not go looking elsewhere. Hence, no adultery. Don't commit adultery, right? Ties right into this one. You can look for somebody, just not somebody else's spouse, right? Intimacy is limited to your legal spouse. That's 1 Corinthians. Okay? Don't be going around and, you know, hooking up with somebody else that's not your spouse. That's really what it comes down to, right? It's about... The sacredness of that union, and it's, it's a pure union, and it's appropriate, and that's what it is, right? Committed to this one person. These types of unions are limited to one man and one woman. Leviticus says that. So does Romans. That's it, okay? This is the instructions. The union does not include male, male, or female, female. That's the Romans one part. So God has made it very clear how he wants this kept. And we're going from Leviticus all the way to Romans, and we're getting the same thing. This is what my design is. This is how I want it to go. Any deviation from the original design is, as Romans says, contrary to nature. 
I think this is most, the most fundamental piece of this. We can say, well, you know, the Bible says, and, you know, God spoke, or spiritual, you know, words from Paul. But the reality is nature attests to God's design. And when it comes to humans, you know, we're not talking about these weird amphibians that can do strange stuff. Because everybody always quotes these frogs that, you know, can change their, their sex or different things. We're talking about human beings here, okay? How we were designed, and this is how it works. Contrary to nature would be anything that goes against the original design. And that's what Paul talks about in Romans. He uses the phrase, contrary to nature. So if you're going to define a marriage... What, what does it have to include? What are the fundamental elements of that before it's no longer defined as a marriage in the biblical perspective? So in God's perspective, okay, I've got this man. He's not married to anybody else. <laughs> okay, He's not a relative. These, these things that God instructs. And you have this woman. And these two are able to join into this union. And then therefore they fall under this definition as God would understand the word marriage. If you have a man... And you have another man, and they say, we want, to get, we want to have a union, a legal, recognized union. How does that fall into God's definition of the marriage union? Well, right. Yeah. But I'm saying like they could still have a relationship, though. Yes. Yeah. And that gets into a whole other thing. Is that an appropriate thing to do? Even though they're not technically under the yeah. definition of a marriage, maybe they're like, oh, we don't care about the union. We don't care about it. Now, that's a whole other thing. It's still contrary to nature. It's no longer, it's not a union. You could say, well, we forego the union because it's limited to this. But it still has lots of problems. Would you agree? Lots of issues that come out of it that nature attests to. If everybody took that position, what would happen to society? What would happen to the nation? It wouldn't exist anymore. There would be no children produced. There would be none of that. So behavior is one thing. The marriage definition is something else. People do a lot of things that are inappropriate. I mean, there's men and women that hook up all the time. They're not married at all. God doesn't support that either, right? But he does support that there's a commitment. It's done properly in his way, by his union, the commitment of one to another, male to female, in the union of marriage. And that's the one that he says... I want you to define marriage for me. Well, now it's gotten so flimsy, everybody wants to just change the wording. My question is, and the reason we're talking about this is, what is the proper definition? What is the accurate? If, if we can redefine anything to mean anything we want, then you might as well just say there is no point in calling anything marriage anymore. It has no boundaries. It has no, no limitations on it. What is it limited to? Is there any limits on this? Biblically, yeah, it's limited. It, and it's very specific, man woman in these manners behavior is something else people can get into all kinds of what we'd say is biblically inappropriate behavior or immoral behavior but they're not necessarily going to come in and say i think you ought to change the definition of marriage to fit my behavior and that's what society is doing today isn't it yeah. i want to do these things and be included in this definition and so let's change the definition and let's get the authorities to do that so I can be included in this definition. Now, there's people out there. Actually, I was thinking about this this week. There's people out there, and I think I even have a slide on it, who have no desire to change the definition of marriage. They're going to do these types. They're just going to engage in behavior that we would say is just not appropriate. But they don't, they don't want to change the definition. They just want to go do whatever they want to do. What happens when the one starts to press in and say, now I want to be included and recognized is legitimately in this union when I'm doing this behavior. And now we have this definitions problem because we have to say, who gets to define Only the God definition? Define. That's what we would say. Is that there has to be some highest authority that can come in and say, here's who gets to define it. Who gets to define marriage? And what is an authority if you're in charge of holding the definitions which is what the governments of the world are supposed to do, is set and uphold these ultimate standards for the flourishing and the good of their societies. How would you know if you were in the government, how, what do I do with this one? What do I promote and try to push and, and you know, try to encourage, and what do I try to discourage? How would you know which one? 
and you'd have to have some authority at some point to say, to know what to do with that. And so like for us, voting. Okay, we're going to redefine marriage on the Colorado Constitution. That's what's on the ballot. And you can either say, well, I'll just look inside and say, how do I feel on this one? How do I feel on this one? Knowing that you could feel something different, right? Or someone next to you could feel something different. And what makes their feeling invalid and yours valid? Why are they wrong and you right? Or are they not? Are you both right, even though you're opposite of each other? Are you both wrong, <laughs> right? The government should have an idea <laughs> of what the good thing to do is in this. And we're going to talk about it. Are they, should they promote what's good? Yes, should. Or should they discourage what's good? Or should they take no position? You see, this is that government debate. And the question is, it doesn't say they're supposed to be neutral. What does it say in Romans? They're supposed to do everything for the good. Not for the neutral, not for the bad, for the good. And so that means when they say this is a good thing for the flourishment of society, should they do something with it? Should they promote it? Of course they should, because it's fundamental to the promotion and the development and the growth and the happiness and the well-being and the future of their society, their nation. And so people say, well, the government really should just stay completely out of this definition of marriage. What they should do is they should encourage the proper definition of marriage. When we look at our society and our, our government today, we're going to say, this is not happening, this is not happening, this is not happening. We're kind of looking at this as what ought to be, not what is. How should it, how should it be? And if we have a chance to say, I get to push the needle in some fashion towards closer towards what ought to be, how would I do that? Is it a yes on this or a no on this? I want to get closer to what ought to be, even though I know we're never going to probably get there. But I want to try to get closer. So when you write your ballot out and you say, okay, Colorado, how do we define this? You know, which one's closer? How do we get that direction? That's why we do this study, is so we can try to figure out what ought to be and how we can say we need to push that direction. We need to go that direction. So here's an objection. What about polygamy? God allowed this in the Old Testament. Is that true? Did he allow it? He did allow it, 100%. David had a lot of wives. Solomon had a lot of wives. Uh, there was a lot of, of polygamy that went on. And you think about the kings, they had concubines and all these things. And here's, here's kind of the thought on this. Okay, Here's the response to this. There's no verse, first of all, in the Bible where God commands this behavior. So just because the Bible, this is important beyond polygamy. But if the Bible records something, that doesn't mean it promotes it. Keep that in mind. Okay? The, people just read it and they say, well, they did that in the Bible, so it must be okay. Not necessarily. The Bible has a lot of history of what was done. But there's never this, okay, God gave that a, a rubber stamp check mark. Now, Solomon had a lot of wives, right? And was God blessing him? God did bless Solomon. Now, so God allowing something is different than God promoting something. Yeah, good point. And we have to keep that in mind. And, and there's a couple illustrations of that. What about divorce? Does God allow it? Yes, he does. He actually tells Moses how you're going to do that. What's the process? You know, What about slavery? Did they have slaves in the Old Testament? Absolutely they did. And, and people go, well, why would God not just come in and say, no, you can't do it? It's over. Shut it off. Why didn't he do that And with some of these types of things like divorce, slavery, and polygamy? Why didn't he come in and just tell them no? People have free will. People do have free will. And what's happened to people since the fall? I just kind of gave you the answer. They've gone more and more sinful. Have they distorted things? Has society embraced things that are systems that are fundamental to it, even economically? that God would say, you know, that's not really what I wanted. That's not what I wanted to have happen. Was slavery an economic piece in the old days, back in this time? It was huge. I mean, they had to, they had to regulate the price of slaves. You know, that was part of the economy. And if God comes in and says, no slavery, does that have impact? Oh, yeah. yeah. What if he said, no divorce? There is none. You can't do it. What happens to the relationships between these husbands and wives? What happens to the woman in this culture? She's destroyed. What does he tell Moses? When these guys want to do this, there's a, there's a process. Now, is God happy about having to give that instruction? 
No. But did he do it? Yes. And it was because he knew if he didn't, what would happen? Because of the sinfulness of human hearts. And this is the place where, you know, you're kind of getting to God's desk now. You're sitting at his desk going, man, how do you contemplate these decisions you make? Why don't you just say no? Why don't you say no? Not doing it. He's going, it's not that easy. I could, absolutely could, but what is that going to do to the people? What's it going to do to the, to the wives? What's it going to do to the husbands? What's it going to do to the nation? What's it going to do? Those are those you know, $10 million questions that God has to answer. And we go, we don't agree. <laughs> we don't agree. You want to kill everybody in this nation? You want to wipe out men, women, and children? We disagree. You've made a moral error. And we're going, you know, we, just, we put God under our microscope of we're all of a sudden sit at the desk. And we think we got all the information. And we can make the best decision. And we forget that God sits in that desk. He's the one who has to make those decisions. And they don't always make a lot of sense to us. In this, he said, I'm not going to stop you. I'm going to discourage you. But I'm going to recognize that in certain states, these things are going to happen. And we're going to have to have a process for how we deal with that. So here's what happens in Matthew 19. So then they are, they're talking to Jesus. Jesus says, so then they are no longer two but one flesh. Who's he talking about? That's Genesis. He's quoting about marriage, right? Man and woman. Therefore, what God has joined together, man must not separate. They said to him, why then did Moses give us a command or to command us to give a document, a certificate of divorce, and to divorce her? If, if God says don't do it, then the answer should have been no. There's no divorces. You can't do it. And so they're, they're trying to trap him. And he says, Moses, with reference to your hardness of heart, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, notice he says, it was not like this. And so what does he attribute the God kind of giving an allowance to here? What does he say about their hearts? If you didn't have this state, we wouldn't have had to go to this. So it's actually your fault. <laughs> it's kind of you know, the roundabout way of saying because of the sinfulness of the human heart, God has had to allow and do things that were not like that in the beginning. That's not how the design was intended to go. And it'll be corrected at some point. But as we go through this process, God is allowing certain things to carry out in order to accomplish something, to not totally end the whole plan at this point. He's not done yet. And so when you think of polygamy, how did it go for those who practiced it in the Old Testament? Not well. It didn't go well, did it? You know, when you've got, you know, Abraham and you've got Ishmael and Isaac, I mean, talk about a feud that's gone on for thousands of years. You know, if he would have just stayed true with his one wife, no others, you know, what would have happened? Well, man, it would have saved a whole lot of heartache. Solomon would have saved a whole lot of heartache. If, if David would have stayed true to his wife and not gone to Bathsheba, and other, what would have happened? Would have been a different story, wouldn't it? Nothing good comes from this is really what it comes down to. And sometimes God can say, listen, just use your brain. If it's not gone well for the people who did it, you probably shouldn't do it as well, right? If it didn't work for them, look at all the trouble they had. Maybe you should go back to my original design and just hold on to that. That's where it works. It doesn't work the other ways. Why is polygamy only argued as a man having multiple wives? What does this do to these women? Like people say God's anti-woman, you know. Is he? I mean, if you think about it, especially in their culture, sure, you got all these wives. What does that do to her when it comes to her connection with her husband? She's got to share that. And now, like you said, he's got a split heart. He's, I got a favorite one. How many times do you read that in the Old Testament? I loved her more than her. You know, it's like this is not going to go well. You can just see it not going well. And it doesn't. Yeah. A lot of cat fights. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of cat fights. That's right. But that's, that's the thing is... When God's designing marriage between one man and one woman, he could have said one man, ten women. But he knew that wasn't going to work. Plus, it's a bigger picture. You rise just above that. Think about God's character when it comes to faithfulness. And his character when he talks about Israel. Does not he use the term adultery a lot when he's talking about his people? So how does he look about his relationship with his people? Like a marriage. Yeah. It's a marriage covenant. It's a, it's a marriage union. And my job is to be faithful to you and you alone. And your job is to be faithful to me and me alone. That's why he tells them, don't go to the other gods of the nations. 
Don't do any of that. It's me and you. It's about one-on-one. -on -one, and that's how he designed marriage to work. The same way. And so even when you get into polygamy, as much as they did it, which they did a lot of things they shouldn't have done, it totally distorts that character of God, of the oneness of one and one together in a relationship, you know. And you think about it, you know, Christ died on the cross so that you and I could have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God, right? You can go in to the throne room now. You can go into the Holy of Holies and you can do it. What happened before that? Before you had Christ do that, how did you interact with God? Well, that wasn't the right, that wasn't exa exactly what God wanted, was it? What did he want? I want you directly. I don't want someone else involved in this. So you can just see how God's character and mindset has always been one, one, together in these types of relationships, right? It's how, we do, how he does things now. So here's a question. Should the government set the definition of marriage? And it's, again, it's a tough question because we want the government to just stay out of everything, which I agree. But they do have some things that are important for them to say we should promote certain behavior in order for the good and the flourishing of society. Would you agree? Yes. And they should discourage other behavior so that people don't get hurt. Hence why Romans 13 says, I've given them the sword. They don't bear it in vain. They're there to punish evil, reward good. Right? So evil, good. We have these two things. Promotion, discouragement, right? They're supposed to do these things. I mean, here it is. For it's, in the government is the it there, is God's servant to you for what is good. Again, we've come back to that almost every week. Is God's definition of marriage something to promote or something to discourage for the good of a nation? I mean, that's kind of the question, right? If it's good for the nation and for humanity and for their society, should they promote it or discourage it? Promote it. You should promote it. Okay. Now, how would we know? How would we know if it's good or bad for the nation? Well, you can just look at the results, right? I mean, you can read it and you can say, well, God said this would be good. You can also watch things play out. God also said you shouldn't murder. How would you know it's not a good thing to murder? Well, you go murder somebody, they throw you in jail or they put you in the death penalty. You go, you know, that wasn't a great idea, was it? You didn't have to, to read it necessarily to find out that was a bad decision, right? But the goal was, the, the fundamental rule was, back as far as you can go, is that it's good to get married and have kids. It's good. It's a good thing. And society, just looking at it, was said, you know, this is a good thing. You're raising up another generation of workers. They're replacing those who are, are, are kind of getting out of the workforce to keep this going and keep it so it's orderly, so people know how to behave, how to be good citizens, and we're going to give benefits. So you want to have kids, we're going to give you a, t a child tax credit. You know, sometimes they even get involved in that process. If you have kids, we're going to give you relief on certain things because why? We want you to have kids. We're not going to punish you. And yet other groups would come in and say, we don't, we're not going to recognize that. They may take a neutral stance. We're not giving you any benefits. Or they may say, in, in some cases, maybe in some countries, like in China, you have these kids, there's going to be a punishment. So what are you trying to tell your citizenry?